Good afternoon. My name is Christiane Querfeld. I'm an attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I'm taking care of patients with skin lymphomas and I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist. Today I'm talking about uh, future directions in skin lymphomas and uh, talking a little bit also about the problems we were facing in the past. How can we reliably distinguish skin lymphomas from benign rashes? What are the new prognostic factors that really can help us um, guiding the treatment? And what are the new future treatments we can offer based on all the research that has been done? So currently what we have is that it's the most important thing is really a solid clinical pathologic correlation. So we have um, the skin findings and we have the findings on pathology. So when we have the pathology, we're using specific markers, T-cell markers, if it's a T-cell lymphoma, and most patients do have a T-cell lymphoma. So we are looking for CD3, CD4, CD8, CD7, CD30. These are markers that are all on the surface of a T-cell. And those markers are important because there are many mimickers, such as drug rashes, uh, for example, or eczema. It can mimic a lymphoma sometimes. And so we have to use those markers, and the relation from one marker to each other is important, um, um, and <clears throat> is important to distinguish from benign rashes where all these markers are um, pretty much um, low expressed. We have molecular analysis, we have uh, so-called the T-cell rearrangement study that proves a clone in the skin, in the skin biopsy that can help to tailor the diagnosis. So the new exploratory tests um, on the skin, these are new markers, um, CD25, FOXP3, PD1, Beta F1, Gamma M3. Beta F1 and Gamma M3, these are markers on the tissue that can prove or not prove whether these infiltrate is clonal. PD-1 has been shown that it's more expressed in patients with lymphomas as opposed to benign rashes. And FOXP3 and CD25 is in particularly highly expressed in patients with Cesare syndrome. We have certain adhesion molecules, markers on the surface of the T-cell. Adhesion molecules are important for homing into certain organs such as skin, blood, or lymph nodes. CCR4 in particular is, enables the cells to live in the skin. If they are expressed CCR7, they can circulate, and CCR10 as well. MicroRNA, these are very uh, small pieces of RNA, can regulate gene expression. And certain uh, mRNAs are expressed in mycosis fungoides, such as CD150, microRNA 203, 205. And these markers have been compared to benign rashes and have been found to be either up or down regulated that can help to define the diagnosis. Certainly, we have all other immune cells in the skin. We have dendritic cells, we have macrophages, we have mast cells. And we just recently learned that those um, in other immune cells are very important in homing or in feeling the tumor cells or helping the tumor cells to grow. Certain tumor cells have modifications on the surface of their DNA. This is called epigenetic modulation. We have heard that mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome and, and is, is thought of a, of a disease where they say there's some stimulation and everybody talks about chronic antigen stimulation but nobody has ever found what, what really stimulates the cells to really home in the skin. And so in the center of the slide, you see this is how skin lymphoma looks like. You have a really lymphocytic infiltrate, and you have so-called portray microabscesses in the epidermis in the very upper layer of the skin. And those are the tumor cells. And so, but we, we haven't really understood why the tumor cells grow. And so recently, we, we, we got to study all these other immune cells, like Langerhans cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and K cells, uh, which are called natural killer cells, and other tissue structures like collagen and other proteins that help really to grow the tumor. 
And those um, immune cells, they can either produce cytokines or that can lead to breakdown of tissue proteins or can um, help to stimulate the tumor cells to divide and grow. And um, we have other immune cells such as cytotoxic T cells. They produce certain cytokines like interferons that boost an immune system. So, and then the tumor cells itself, the malignant cells, they can have a lot of uh, mechanisms to overcome the checkpoints in the immune systems, and they can express certain checkpoint molecules, such as PD-1, such as CTLA-4, and produce cytokines that are more immunosuppressive, such as interleukin-10. And so why, while in early stage, we know that um, the body can really control the tumor cells, why is the body not able to control it in advanced stages? What, what mechanisms make the tumor cells really to grow where we don't have any balance anymore, where we see that the tumor cells take over? What are the key prognostic markers that help guide the clinical management of cutaneous lymphomas? And so we have the clinical signs, we have skin pathology, we have laboratory tests, we have molecular tests. These tests together, they define the prognosis of a patient. And then this tailors the management. So the clinical signs can be very easy, just patches and plaques, like we all know, they can be red, but it can be also very difficult because they can be so-called hypopigmented, meaning um, can mimic a vitiligo, they can be folicotropic, meaning affecting the hair, affecting glands. Granulomatous become very scaly and very thick. And poikilodermatous, like the skin is very thin. We have the so-called TNMB stage, meaning the TNMB stage stands for skin involvement, lymph node involvement, organ involvement, and bone marrow and blood involvement. And so we have patches and plaques and nodules and redness and diffuse redness. And so this all defines really how we tailor the treatment. And we also include how old is a patient, um, is a patient um, very young or in, in ch a childbearing age, or is a patient older and cannot tolerate very harsh treatments. The pathology can also help to guide us transformation is something when the tumor cells become very large and sometimes those large cells don't respond to treatments that have been previously worked in those patients. And so sometimes those tumor cells proliferate, grow very rapidly. This can be shown on a test, it's called Key 67, which is a marker for proliferation. There can be certain markers that can be positive or negative. Those markers I have mentioned before, such as PD-1, CD-25, CD-30, also very important, a CD-4 and CD-8 ratio. If it's very high, it's likely that there are more tumor cells than reactive cells in the skin. And then the tumor microenvironment, so all these other um, immune cells that can help to downregulate those tumor cells and sometimes are not efficient enough. Blood tests, LDH is a sensitive but unspecific marker. We have eosinophils in the blood, we have immunoglobulins in the blood and so-called beta-2 microglobulin, which is also in the blood test. As for molecular findings, molecular tests, the T cell rearrangement study is the only study that's really done on a daily basis. All these other studies, like gene expression profiling, microRNA, is investigational and has not been established yet as a daily adjunctive test um, for diagnosis. But those tests are very, very important, and hopefully in the future there will be a reliable test, um, such as a gene expression profiling, that can help really to distinguish benign from reactive tissue. There have been already a few studies out that had proven that there's a unique signature for certain types of skin lymphomas, especially or certain stages, especially the tumor stages carry a, a different profile compared to very early stages. So this is a detailed photograph, so to speak, of a T cell. And what you see here has many, many surface markers. 
And so the surface markers on the right side, starting in red to yellowish color, these are checkpoint molecules. And those molecules are more immunosuppressive. And on the opposite side in blue, these are activation markers. And so usually when a T cell is normal, is in equilibrium between the activation markers and the immunosuppressive markers. So in a malignant cell, such as a typical lymphocyte in mycosis fungoides, it's out of control, and there may be activation markers on, but also the immunosuppressive checkpoint molecules. So there has been done significant research in developing treatments that can attack those molecules, such as PD-1. There's an anti-PD-1 treatment for cutaneous lymphomas. This treatment has been also established for melanoma patients. We have other treatments such as CTLA-4 that also suppresses the expression of these markers. And when you see on this T cell on the top in green, there are the regular markers like CD2, CD4, CD3, CD30. And CD30 has also been developed in a trial that detects those molecules to bind to this molecule and that leads to cell killing. So this is an algorithm how we approach treatments in patients. And you see on the top there the stages outlined, stage 1A to stage 4A and 4B. And so um, stage 1A is very, very early and very limited. And all the skin-directed treatments come into place. We have the steroids, we have the topical retinoids, such as bexarotene, we have the topical nitrogen mustard, and we have the whole spectrum of phototherapy. And phototherapy can be further divided into narrowband, UVB phototherapy, and PUVA therapy, UVA1 therapy. So if the skin becomes more widespread, you still can use topical treatment, sometimes you need an additional treatment or combined treatments. You can either combine the skin-directed treatments or combine it with a systemic therapy. And one of those first-line treatments, when patients become a little more advanced, meaning widespread skin disease, sometimes the lymph nodes um, grow a little bit larger, then you have to consider interferons or ret systemic retinoids, meaning targretin. If a patient becomes completely red from head to toe, extracorporeal photophoresis may be very helpful. And this can also be given in combination with retinoids or interferon. We have antibodies such as alentuzumab. We have anti-CD30, which is um, investigational. Alentuzumab has been shown to be very effective in cesare patients. If it really works, um, it works um, quickly. They have the new group of so-called HDAC inhibitors, Romidepsin and Vorinostat, are two treatments. One is oral, which is the Vorinostat, and one is given as an infusion therapy. Those two drugs have been developed to change or revise the so-called epigenetic modulation I have outlined or have discussed this before. We have hardcore chemotherapy, which is, should be only given if every other treatment doesn't work and to rapidly clear the skin. So it's not ideal for early stages or for, for patients who can be controlled with other medications. We have clinical trials that can be given from very early stages to advanced stages, and this is mainly dependent on what's available in your center. It's also dependent what you and your, your doctor feel what would be appropriate, but this would be an additional chance, an additional option uh, for treatment. Stem cell transplant is something not every patient needs. It's only if all other options have been used and don't work and the lymphoma still comes back and still gets more aggressive. This would be something that can help to cure. This is probably one of the only treatments that can cure currently cutaneous lymphomas. Just like to point out some investigational therapies, we have the anti PD-1 antibody that's currently in clinical trials in some centers.
this treatment can be given with another antibody, CTLA-4. Those um, two treatments actually block these immunosuppressant checkpoint molecules. And when you give this, the ideal is that your immunosuppressive stage actually will be revised and malignant cells die off. We have antibodies against CCR4, which is a skin homing molecule, and it particularly works very well in patients with mycosis fungoides. And we have another antibody, CD30, that works very well in patients which tumor cells express CD30. And then romidepsin and lenalidomide is a combination. Those um, medications have been used as single agents in mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, but the combination is new. And hopefully with different mechanisms of actions, there will be higher activity in those patients. And there's also a new treatment, um, it's called PI3 kinase inhibitor. It's a signaling pathway that's activated in mycosis fungoides and can be used as well. So I thank you for attention. This is my team at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Thank you.